Welcome to Peer to Peer, the podcast, brought to you by Rainer. Listen in as we hear from top surgeons having great conversations with their peers about hot and popular topics in ophthalmology. For this episode of Peer to Peer, the podcast, we head down under and listen in on a series of presentations and discussions that took place recently at the Australian Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons Congress about EMV and EMV toric, patient counselling and outcomes, and more. The session includes previous podcast guests, Graham Barrett, Philomena Ribeiro, Carl Stonecipher, and Damien Gatineau. Some new voices, Georgia Cleary, Dean Corbett and Brian Harrisburg, and a few anonymous audience members. Let's dive in. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to Rainer for putting on such a great opportunity to talk about something which I think is very interesting. So EMV is, after many years of uh, thinking about lenses and lens designs and optics, uh, a solution that would in my mind, give patients uh, some solution to their reading ability, but a solution that will give them the best satisfaction with the least compromise in their quality of vision. And that concept was something I called uh, EDF, Extended Depth of Focus. So, you know, we were surrounded by multifocals and uh, being promoted very heavily and although I had um, started multifocals when they were first introduced in about 91, 92, and there was one of the first people to use the 3M multifocal, I, I soon became aware of the limitations and the compromise. And I thought, well, gosh, maybe what we need to do is extend the depth of focus to a certain amount. And um, realizing that you can do so much and no more before you're going to compromise vision, even with extended depth of focus. But staying within the boundary, uh, having a lens which would pass all the criteria for a quality monofocal, but a little bit more extended depth of focus, and combine that, not as an afterthought, but with intention, with a level of myopia in one eye to get an augmented effect, a synergistic effect. And that was the kernel of the idea. And the story is it's taken 10 years to find a partner um, to take that concept to the market. And uh, it was worth the wait because those of you who have worked with Rainer and know Rainer uh, know that this is not only quality vision, but it's a quality partner. Um, so this is the culmination of 10 years and I'm as excited, uh, if not more so than you are, to hear what this amazing panel that has been put together this evening, their thoughts. This is the most fun part of my career, sitting back and rather than necessarily speaking about something that no one's quite heard of, but something that's being used practically and hear other people's experience. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what they've got to say. And without that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Damon is kind of like a brother, we do the same things, we do RL formulae, we do apps for toric alignment, um, he's much more learned, I mean he's a mathematician, but we also share an interest in optics and science. Um, I'm not going to read out the full CV I've got, but just to say he's one of the lead leaders at the Rothschild Institute, and uh, if you want to understand optics, you should listen to Damien, because he has a, a deep understanding, not only that, but he shares it in a very clear and lucid manner. So Damon, you're the first speaker, and your presentation is EDOF Optics, Reality or Myths. Thank you, Graham. I will uh, speak about uh, what we are doing now in uh, our lab. And there's a lot of terms that have been put forward over the last years and they are mostly kind of, uh, I would say, uh, marketing artifacts still to disguise the uh, blunt truth, which is that light is usually absorbed, reflected, refracted, diffracted, or scattered, but there's no much more than that, and you have to deal with this to design lenses. And uh, again, uh, we've studied diffractive lenses, which is not my topic, but from the structure of those lenses, we published that you can derive their optical properties more or less like for example, the first EDOF lens, which was uh, seriously, would say, introduced as a non-diffractive lens by its manufacturer over the last years, 
uh, has been now accepted to be a true diffractive IOL with a spacing which shows that it is a bifocal distance and intermediate in some ways. So EDOF lenses were introduced um, uh, a few years ago and they work with two or three principles, at least negative spherical aberration for most of them, positive spherical aberration for the Reiner, and for the Alcon VVT, a wave front stretching concept, which is not very well described, but which tend to suggest that it is a specific mechanism. Dealing with refractive IOL, this is what we measured as the uh, spherical aberration of the Reiner lens, and it's obviously a positive one on this diameter for a 20.5 dioptric element. And what we've done then is to uh, calculate for different IOLs or measure, I would say, the positive spherical aberration. It's originally inducing positive spherical aberration for all pupil diameters until um, I think the diameter of 4.5 or 5 where it becomes negative again to balance a bit. If you would compare this curve to, um, in fact, the monofocal spherical IOL MA60AC curve, it's very close. But this is again for a 4.5 aperture and a spherical aberration of 0.21. The problem with those lenses is that when you see curves, they are always referring to a specific aperture and spherical aberration. And these are different lenses here, the EMV, the Luxmart, the VVT, and the INs for a 3 millimeter aperture and for a specific corneal model with positive circular aberration. You see, they don't behave the same, but they all have an extended kind of MTF curve um, with uh, one lobe, two lobes sometimes, but that may change over the different pupil diameters. So as you know, all eyes are different in terms of circular aberration and pupil dynamics. And on average, the pupil uh, dynamics and spherical aberration makes that for spherical aberration. Average would be on the 6 millimeter pupil, 0.28 is the only key coefficient. You see, for a small pupil, regardless of the uh, spherical aberration, the true focus curve is the same. But if you dilate the pupil, aspherosity tends, the corneal aspherosity, I'm, I'm saying, is interfering with the lens aspherosity, and the peaks are shifting and uh, they are lowering because of the impact of spherical aberration and also shifting toward the right to more power and etc. So we of course um, analyzed the EMV lens and you see that the EMV lens is very close to the spherical IOL. It has probably a bit of a lesser optical quality because you need to extend the depth of focus to some expense which is uh, uh, the, um, the optical quality is straight against depth of focus. It works quite well and it provides you with a large depth of focus. But of course, if you dilate the pupil or if you move to uh, exotic spherical aberration values, the lens behavior changes. I think, as Graham explained, they, they made it more um, uh, prominent to extend the depth of focus beyond what you would have with a spherical IOL. So in conclusion, the good news is, is that what you lose a bit, you gain in terms of depth of focus compared to the reference spherical IOL. So again, this is a nice, I think, objective way to uh, assess that this lens is uh, doing something specific and achieve a superior depth of focus than a monofocal. On this, I thank you for your attention. So when it comes to optics, uh, it's challenging because there's this broad description of EDOF enhanced multifo um, monofocal, and there's all these different optical mm. principles and none of them are the same and so when you talk about EDOF or monofocal plus you really have to understand the optics to understand that lens because it's all different and and when I started off with a clean slate and I had to decide well what am I going to do I looked at phase shift like vivity diffractive options I looked at negative spherical aberration because kind of thinks intuitively that that should be the the positive has some unique characteristics. It's asymmetric. It leans to the correct side if you want to read better. Negative is the other side. You also need to understand that um, when you have spherical aberration, negative, for instance, you are exquisitely sensitive to decentration. Minimal amount of decentration, the optical performance drops off. Whereas if you go with positive, it's quite robust. And, uh, so th th there's reasons why it's positive, and um, they're good reasons. <laughs>
Um, Graham and Damien, what about patients who are post-refractive ha- and who inherently have spherical aberration if they've had hyperopic versus myopic? Which of those patients with this lens work better with? Do you have to measure the absolute amount of spherical aberration in those patients? That's very interesting. We, we, we simulated negative spherical aberration with all IOLs. And you can make a head of lens like the Rhino a very monofocal one in terms of total uh, impact if you have a cornea which matches what induces the lens. In other words, if you have a positively aberrated lens, IOL, and you put a negative cornea in front of it, it can balance so that you have a very nice monofocal performance. So in the future, I think we will have to consider this spherical collaboration and pupil diameter or pupil dynamics to optimize um, the results of the patient depending on what they want. If they want to be very monofocal or if they want depth of focus, etc. You can probably customize patients today with the all area, all array of lens we have for specific tasks and specific eyes. But that's important again. I, I think it's huge in clinic clinical studies because we're doing that with LASIK patients. So I've got this huge population of, of, of hyperopic LASIK and myopic LASIK. And Graham and I have had this discussion, I refer you to that uh, online too, that in the hyperopic population, when you try and put, say, a vividity lens in these people, they get a bit of a smudge depending on how you know, much uh, uh, the steepness you've created idiopathically. But I think in myopic, you have to really look out for that because you can create a bit of an issue in terms of their vision. Uh, Graham, you have any comments on that? Look, I, I think if you've got an RK patient in particular, you should be cautious because mm-hmm. they may have a lot of spherical. If you've got a, a modern day LASIK PRK, you won't find much. You could double check by checking their aberration, but usually it's not going to be that much. If you have an old LASIK patient or PRK with a very small pupil, I would caution that you should check their spherical aberration before you add any additional uh, positive. But for a normal low myop, I don't think it would be an issue. Do we need to routinely measure, I mean we should routinely measure pupil sizes um, and what is there an optimal pupil size for these patients? I mean I I think if you're doing uh, uh, age-related cataract, someone in their 50s plus, the pupils tend to be small, especially after cataract surgery gets smaller. I don't think it would be an issue. I mean, if you're doing a young person, uh, perhaps it would be worth checking that their pupil's not you know, six to seven millimeters in mesopic conditions, because obviously, although the impact of dilatation is addressed somewhat, by the spherical aberration getting less as you get towards the periphery, uh, you really wouldn't want to have a large, large pupil and have a lens because the spherical aberration would be more. Yeah, I think, again, pupil dynamics may be important in young patients. It may be also very important in elderly patients. I have patients, they have a nice depth of focus with very monofocal lenses, and usually they have very small pupil, so they have this pinhole effect that... Uh, before I say something more, should my answers remove this penalty of Vegemite? <laughs> no. I tried, I tried. So Philomena, you're, you're talking to a patient and the Canadians are now doing great studies and they're showing that that extended range of vision is keeping people from falling, which is a huge deal in the age population. So how do you explain to patients, you know, I'm more, I mean, Shira Dai and, and a lot of the Europeans are now trying to come up with some concept of, okay, what are we going to explain it to the patient? You know, I say you're in a grocery store, you're going to be able to see Bob at the end of the aisle, you're going to be able to see the Vegemite on the shelf, pull it off, still (laughs) see it's got a ton of vitamin B in it, you know, all those good qualities, but they don't really get what an enhanced monofocal is. Uh, So monofocal plus, enhanced monofocal, I'm using more terms like extended range of vision or full range of vision. What what do you tell patients and how do you explain it? Well, uh, it's different between countries, of, mm-hmm. course, of course, and cost if is an issue. We need to address that. But for instance, in our uh, hospital right now, for a select patient for monofocal uh, IOLs, we use an enhanced monofocal. We don't need to explain nothing to the right. patient, and they will benefit this functional vision. 
And we're the same way. I mean, in the U.S., we can't charge extra for a Ray EMV. We don't have the Touric variety at this point, so we don't really even bring up that discussion. But I separate the eyes by about a week, and so when you come back, the first thing I was just talking to my wife Lynn about this, when you come back, I look at you and I say, okay, what do you think of that first eye? And I always do the dominant eye first, and I said, if they say I like it, do you want me to match the set? If they don't like it, I look at them and I say, okay, what do you need more? Do you need a little bit more near? you need a little bit more distance? And which are you willing to wear? A pair of glasses to drive at night or a pair of reading glasses? So Graham, you, you have thought of this lens as enhanced monofocal forever. I mean, that's kind of the, where you came up with it. So when you're talking about this lens to a patient now, um, when you're thinking of defocus, are we're always at minus 75, we're at minus one, we're at minus one and a quarter, and how do you make that judgment? I look, for me, it's fairly straightforward uh, because I'm very enthusiastic about modest monovision. I'm not scared about it at all. So if someone wants to get that extra reading, I would be very happy to go for a target of minus one, expecting more spectacle independence. And you know, when you look at the defocus curves that Damien showed, what is uh, part and parcel of this lens is the overlap of the distance and the near eye. And uh, the blended vision, so the ability to tolerate modest monovision without much thought, you don't have to use it at that target. You can target plano in both eyes. If you hesitate, you can target maybe minus a half in one eye. But for me personally, I would do what I would do with a monofocal yeah. lens or monofocal toric, and that's um, target minus one. And, and do people think about not only what their habits are, but what their hobbies are? So if I've got a great tennis player, or if I've got a great golfer, you know, doing a bit of change in a typical monofocal lens is a problem. Because if they're playing tennis like with a, you know, a symphony lens, they, they just, they lose the ball if they're a 4-0, a 5-0 level player. If they're a 4 or less handicap, uh, they have problems judging distances. So do you look at hobbies as well, or do you talk to people? Marginally so. I think um, the range of people who could have this lens is so broad. Um, I've done um, uh, standard monovision with uh, you know, really top class tennis players, not have an issue as long as you limit the defocus. And I'd be even more comfortable with that same level of defocus with an EMV because I've got even more interaction. So things like stereo, etc., I would not expect an issue at that level. But I do know some people hesitate with modest monovision. And part of my excitement about this lens is I think it will give them more comfort in considering some degree of myopia and taste the success that you can get with that approach. Philomena, you got any final comment? Yes, uh, I think monovision is very well tolerated. Uh, I'm not a fan of monovision with the standard uh, monofocals, but it's true that this IOL provides me more comfort uh, using a micro monovision because the, the IOL is more tolerant to, to this uh, refractive error. I agree. And uh, one thing that uh, we should keep in mind is when we talk about uh, glasses or spectacles independence, it's is, uh, important to mention that these patients don't need uh, progressive glasses, which are uh, a main issue for health, for instance, because of the falls in the early patients. And it's something that we need to also consider. My uh, pleasure to introduce Georgia, um, practices in Victoria. And um, an ex-fellow of mine, Paul Ursel, said, you must keep an eye open from, because she did her fellowship training in the UK, and he said, just keep your eye open for her. And she's really special. And, she's, and he was right. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Georgia, who's uh, on the cutting edge of new technology, new lenses, and she will give her experience on EMV case studies and toric stability. Thank you. It's just while we've been discussing, I've been thinking about those really difficult patients are like you, 
who come to you and they're just a little bit myopic and you're saying, well, I can do distance or I could do near or I could do this or I could that to you know, reduce glasses for A, B or C. And they say, but I don't wear glasses at all for anything. So I think in some ways they are actually the most difficult patients trying to simulate what their little bit of myopia and their cataract and their aberrations are giving them. Um, with any new lens, it's probably not a bad idea just to start off with some easier cases. And we're all taught that for trifocal lenses or perhaps EDOFs that we should start with a hypermetrope with bad cataracts so they basically can't see anything and anything would be an improvement. And this doesn't really apply to this case, but you know, it's I suppose not a, a bad idea when you're beginning with the new technology. But on reflection, the ones who don't go so well, they're kind of your unhappiest patients because if you don't get that distance eye really good, they're not happy. If the near eye is too much or too little, they're not happy. And the near eye might interfere with the distance eye. So there's just lots of reasons why I've found that I'm moving away for that from that. And that's probably at a time where the EMV has come in for me and kind of blended the gap between the eyes. Um, this one I think is quite interesting. So patient who's interesting for medical reasons. And I've done a bit of a mix and a match approach with this lady. So she's 52. She's a clinical psychologist, but she's on her computer a lot. So screens are really important to this lady. She's 52 and she's got lupus. So she's had a lot of steroid over the years and she's had hydroxychloroquine at a high dose. And her usual ophthalmologist is quite concerned about macular toxicity with a high cumulative dose. He did her first eye cataract surgery. And this lady is a little bit tricky also because she's a little bit of a low myope. So she told me that she wore glasses for distance, just a small prescription. And when she got into her 40s, she wore some reading glasses. And when cataract surgery was discussed for her first eye, her dominant eye, she was offered, look, distance or near, and was told anything else, the technology is just not there. So they went for distance. And you know, on paper, she's had a good result. She's 6'6", six, six, right? She's Plano. She's had a ZC Boo lens and everything looks perfect, but actually she's unhappy with her near vision. And she's also got dysphotopsias in this uh, dominant eye. So she's seeing halos at night and halos when she's driving. She's also got a clinically significant cataract in the other eye. So she's only refracting up to 618, struggling there. She was keen to have a little bit of extra range. The range is the word I like to use with my patients. But I would really not be keen to put any more complex optic into an eye that has been identified at risk of macular toxicity. So macula is normal at this stage. Her autofluorescence is normal. Um, she's a, a slightly longer axial length, but again, biometry is not too exciting. So we discussed options. I would not put a multifocal in her. I wasn't keen to use the same type of lens, of course, with dysphotopsia in the first eye. So I went with the hydrophilic product and we went for a low myopic outcome. And the aim was predicted for minus 0.64 because that was closest to my minus 0.75, which I'm sort of finding is what I like here. And this went well. So she said a distance is okay. It's not as good as the other eye, which is fine, but the computer vision is great. So she's really comfortable on her computer and for small print, she's putting on some glasses and she has no dysphotopsia. So I've given her some range. The lens is doing what it says on the tin. You have to be really careful that you're not promising complete spectacle independence, but I was happy with that. Georgia, I'm definitely finding from my experience that they're turning out more myopic than intended. We just spoke about that earlier. Um, so what's your approach with the dominant eye? Are you aiming for how much plus are you aiming for? Because I feel like my feeling <laughs> is they're ending up minus a half yeah. over yeah. what you um, see on your eye master. Yeah, I'm going, I guess, for that first plus. And if mm -hmm. and the first plus or maybe if it's the first plus is only, say, 0 0.05 or 0 0.07, I might go for the plus 0.25, plus 0.3. So I'm going a little bit more. Yeah, but it's hard because if we're not sure about our refractions, and again, we've had similar experiences of refractions that don't make sense, where we have pretty good uncorrected vision, but a significant, say, minus one-ish refractive error. 
So are we just refracting that extended depth of focus there? So again, well, I think there needs to be that a protocol, like Dr. Hill said, a really clear protocol for how we refract or just push, push, push plus. I think that's very important. When you're looking back at stuff and data, you gotta have somebody that can refract. I refract my patients just like Warren does. So I think it's important. I think this whole issue of refraction is very interesting because I th it, it, if there isn't a single sharp point of focus with this lens, then are we trying to measure something that's not actually helpfully measured here? Because what we are trying to measure is the midpoint of a range. And when you ask the patient, are you seeing, perceiving 6-6 six, six vision here, or another half up to apart, they will still say, yes, I'm seeing 6-6. Six, six. So what we're, actually, the, what we're actually using to measure isn't going to measure what we're actually going to be getting potentially with the optics from what I can understand of the optics. Yeah and it may not be the midpoint of that range it you know we're probably trying to measure the far point of that range in my eyes that I've aimed more myopic so I guess I started out with my monofocal typical kind of plan and some of those are coming out very myopic so I've pushed back on that so I guess I want Plano minus 0.75 five with my fudge factor included. So my pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker. And Dean, I've known you since you were an earnest fellow from uh, well, New Zealand stroke Melbourne. And I've seen you just grow into you know, one of the elite. I mean, you did the extended depth of focus work with Symphony originally from New Zealand. So I was delighted to hear that you were involved in, uh, in the Rainer lens and looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you, Graham. When we go to the operating theatre, it's been an interesting uh, exercise to move to a very new operating theatre in Queenstown where the, the nurses are not trained. Having a product that uh, I don't have to load um, and is an absolutely excellent product to use in, in my hands with this uh, fully preloaded injector is an absolute bonus. Um, and you know this this product's been really well designed. It's one of the best preloaded injectors I've I've ever used. Um, it folds the lens beautifully, um, and the uh, uh, the wound size is is very attractive for us. It's a 2.2 millimeter wound size without any uh, any concerns whatsoever. The lens product has been designed to centrate within the bag and it is one of the most beautiful lenses. Rain has been around for a long, long time and their, their IOL design in terms of uh, its ergonomics is absolutely f fabulous. But for those who haven't used the product, it really is a, a, an injection of viscoelastic into the cartridge, folding the, uh, the cartridge closed, which folds the IOL. Uh, and, uh, and then we introduce it into the eye. And in, in my experience, it really will go straight into the bag uh, without any uh, extra manipulation. It unfolds very smoothly and slowly. Um, and I can generally get both haptics in, in the bag without a secondary uh, manipulation. So uh, moving on to my early outcomes, is even better than uh, might have been demonstrated in some of the other defocus curves. So uh, it's definitely behaving very nicely uh, from a functional point of view. So I'd just like to share a case presentation. Um, uh, a 65 year old plus 3.5 diopter hyper oak, great person to start with. Um, and uh, unremarkable examination, good corrected vision. The word cataract annoys me a bit. Uh, uh, I think that everybody over the age of uh, 50 has cataract. Uh, it's a cloudy lens and cloudy lenses started about the age of 30. Um, if you look at a 20-year-old's lens and you look at a 40-year-old's lens, they don't look the same. So uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a silly word. I talk about cloudy lenses and, and people kind of understand that. And I use the term uh, uh, lens replacement rather than cataract surgery. And that creates a lot of, uh, uh, of, of acknowledgement and understanding. I think it'd be useful for us to all move in the same direction. I really, if a patient has good corrected vision before I'm going to embark, I will almost always recommend a contact lens simulation, trying to confirm to them that this is not a slam dunk. You've got to have some skin in the game here. 
and committing them to a contact lens simulation helps me understand their visual system a lot better. So it's a little bit like going through the biometry, making sure the biometry is right. This is prepping the patient to understand uh, whether they're going to be a suitable candidate to introduce the degree of, 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 of uh, splitting of perception between the two eyes. And he did well. Um, so uh, he had uh, astigmatism in his right eye, so I, I decided to use uh, an eye hance in the right eye and in the left eye uh, an EMV. Simultaneous same day surgery, and he was delighted, uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, with excellent function and the refractive targets, you know, we can all decide what they are. Um, so the conclusions I have is that the EMV lens is a, is a terrific option with an emetropic target to give patients intermediate vision. It's a great starting point for, for, for people who want to give patients more than what a monofocal will give. Uh, EMV with mini monovision is, is really going to potentially deliver terrific functional vision for people. Michael was talking about not using N as a uh, measure of near vision. I kind of disagree with him. Everybody's got different length arms. Uh, it actually depends on where they want to hold something and where they functionally use it uh, as opposed to what uh, is going to be a, um, a measure at a given distance. Everybody's got different distances and different uh, roles that they want to achieve their visual outcomes from. Um, we know that, we've talked about that, and again, it's a terrific product to use, and it's a proven platform from a great company that I think uh, has, has uh, shown us great persistence in the market and support of their products. Most importantly, there's no dysphotopsias. And Carl, it's amazing synergy and, and, and uh, uh, similarity of our approaches that is, is really coming together in, in this day and age, I think, of what we're trying to deliver. You know, there's a lot of marketing around glasses. They're an appliance and they're a crutch, in my opinion. That They, they deliver poor peripheral vision. Uh, they're absolutely useless for our regular activities. And as Carl's already said, they cause accidents and people die from wearing glasses. Thank you. So, introduce Brian. Brian, uh, you're always looking laterally and trying new things. Um, and you're one of the first surgeons in Australia to use Rainer EMV. But today you're going to tell us about a case study yeah. and particular results. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Um, so, background, I've got 18 months experience in EMV. And, and 10 days ago, this lady presented for a three-week post-op. And I decided, no, nah, this is something we need to talk about. So it's a quick case study. I'll just put my uh, EMV glasses on. <laughs> it's bloody hopeless. Who invented this EMV? <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, I can read that one. Yeah. Anyway, so... This lady is, uh, it's fairly unique case history. I've known her for 30 years. She's the executive to the surgical uh, director of Prince Alfred Hospital, where I've been for 30 years. So when she was young, she had uh, pigment dispersion syndrome with uh, pressures that would fluctuate. And her past history is her spherical equivalence around about minus three in the right arm, minus 275 on the left. She has had uh, isotropia as a child and strabismus surgery and suspected right amblyopia but not confirmed and occasionally she get intermittent diplopia. So at a, at a time I said oh, it looks like we need to control your pressure because uh, the fluctuation. So we gave her some uh, uh, glaucoma drops and she was completely non-compliant. She is light sensitive, she's drop sensitive, and prone to red eyes. She's got a Celtic pale skin, and she really didn't enjoy drops, and so she didn't use them. So my issue was, uh, I need to control pressure, so we introduced uh, SLT, which worked well for several years. And it would be two or three years she wouldn't come back for follow-up, so she was a problematic patient. 
and I knew that. So she says, can you do anything for my vision? And I said, well, hang on. We need to do something for your pressure. Your pressures have gone into the 20s and you're non-compliant and we've used laser. We need to look at pressure management. And she says, well, can you do pressure and vision at the same time? And I thought, oh, well, why not? I'll just phone Dean Corbett, ask him what to do. Anyway, <laughs> it's a difficult uh, situation where she has a preference for reading. I know she's got iris trans illumination. She's light sensitive. She's never going to handle a multifocal implant. So what do you do? Well, she enjoys her sewing and she works on computers, avid reader, and she's prepared to accept distance glasses. So we had a chair time of one hour over several visits. I'll run through her, her examination, 67.566, vitometry minus 375 plus 12581, minus 375 plus 175 at 10. Pressure's outside the range, and she has some disc cupping, but interestingly, the disc morphology didn't change over 20 years. She had all the features of uh, pigment dispersion syndrome, including a Krukenberg spindle. And as you can see, the disc morphology is not 100% normal. She may be losing some ganglion cells and some superior retinal nerve fibula, but that, that was a priority. We have to get a pressure down and reliably keep it down. And if you remove her lens, you're gonna remove the stimulus for pigment dispersion and we also get a pressure reduction standard with lens removal. And so I decided we should do uh, lens-based surgery with eye stents. Now to choose the lens. So I chose Array 1 MV Toric. Now I'm not a monovision uh, advocate. I'm more multifocal mini monovision. So the aim was minus 129 right eye a minus 118 left eye. So there's a good chance I'm going to get minus 1.5, minus 1.6. But so what? She'll wear glasses. So day three post-op, she's 6.15, she's 6.12. Reading N5, very happy. She's got a near vision and she's quite impressed with the distance vision. She's the type of lady who'd walk around the house without glasses, so she accepted distance blur. And 6.12 is outperforming her spherical equivalent minus three at 612 she said oh yeah my distance vision and then at three weeks she shows up 6667.5 n5 n5 intermediate and near so we've hit the jackpot but you can still refract her and this is where um warren hill would say yeah yeah refraction but the bottom line is if you add minus she sees even better we didn't push her to 6, 4.5 or anything like that, but uh, we got a pressure reduction and we've outperformed. We were targeting maybe 6, 9, 6, 12. We weren't really expecting 6, 6. So there's something in her eye that's allowing us a surprise factor and it's not something we can complain about. In this case, we wanted to maintain near vision, but obviously move it away from minus 3. So we're going to make it more practical. She's fully aware she will not be able to achieve driving vision unaided. We needed lower IOP. And what has happened, she's outperforming in the distance. She's independent of glasses for near tasks and most distant tasks. I suspect she will need photochromatic distance correcting glasses and possible night driving glasses. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think we'll wrap it up. I just yeah. want to thank each speaker for bringing something different. Uh, we learn from everybody and uh, I'm sure if there's any other questions we can carry on. But thank you so much. For more information about this episode's topic and to read the show notes, visit the Peer to Peer Hub at rainer.com forward slash peer to peer. If you enjoyed listening to this conversation, please subscribe to our channel to be notified of new episodes. This podcast is provided for general information purposes only. The presenter's views are their own. Rayner does not endorse off-label use. Users must refer to the product labelling and instructions for use for Rayner products in all cases. Not all Rayner products are available in all countries. The full disclaimer can be found in the show notes.